<laughs> I'm in my thirties, you know, and to me, like, yeah, I was a Bernie supporter, but at the same time, I'm very much a pragmatist. And, um, uh, you know, when he didn't win, I was, I was like, he better fucking endorse Hillary because like, that is just that is from a practical point of view that is what he basically had to do because yeah he wasn't going to win and and his his revolutionary idea wasn't even about who who is president that actually isn't the most important thing it's more about state yeah. level legislation actually um, it's just the mark the mark that he left with that can't unprecedented even i think like, in our you know. lifetimes certainly yeah progressivism has basically been dead since jimmy yeah. carter yeah. Somebody who really what um, happened with like Obama in 2008, where everybody was like, you know, with him, it was like a lot of people were coming out more than they usually do to vote. Yeah. Pretty amplified that effect by a, a couple times over, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, well, what I was um, saying was that there's a, there's a lot of Bernie supporters who are now Hillary supporters in a, in a, in a because of a, like a um, best of both. Well, what is it? What's the term? Um, you know, uh, lesser of two evils kind of thing, right? But they're like, well, you know, yeah. I'm not a supporter of her, but she's better than the other guy, so I'm going to vote for her or support her. Um, I'm not like, pretty much every I'm not one of those people. Um, I am a Hillary supporter now, but not just because of that. I, take, I actually take it further than that. And um, the reason is, is because after uh -huh. the primaries ended, I kind of had a revelation about the nature of politics and the inevitabilities of who the first female president was always going to be not as a person but in terms of their policies because in like most of the western world if you look at who their first female leader was this actually isn't the case in my country but in most western countries the first female leader is a war hawk uh, is very much a political insider um, with tons of connections among the powerful elites because they have to have that in order to be the first female head of state that's just like a prerequisite. You can't make it in a boys club unless you're basically one of the guys, you know, um, for yeah. all intents and purposes. So basically to me, it comes down to um, the, what I'm saying is I don't believe the I want a first female president, but just not that one argument. I don't think that's valid because that is always going to be who the first female president of the United States is going to be. Someone like Elizabeth Warren doesn't really have a shot. You know, with her yeah. policies the way they are. She's not going to be president with those policies. She's not going to be the first female president with those policies. She might be yeah. the second or third, but not the first. Yeah. That's just how it works. You know, It's the same with Obama. Obama's a war hawk. Obama has tons of political connections and is an insider. It's the same thing. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, it just kind of puts me in, in a weird situation because I've always kind of thought for the past like year or so, like, like all the no president, like everyone is the president. We all, you know, but I mean, that's just kind of the, the whole, like, you know, the sense of anarchists of kind of being utopian and like, you know, oh, things will be this way someday guys. But like, it's, it's moving very slowly. I feel like. Yeah. Well, the, yeah I, two things about that. It, One thing, the good thing about anarcho syndicalism is that you can point to somewhere in the world where it is happening and does work spain you know mm -hmm. and yeah. these other places in the world there's a anarcho syndicalist community in in syria and i can't remember what that's called but there's one there's at least one rajava in, sorry say again rajava yeah yeah exactly yeah and there's others around yeah. the world as well so these are places that real i mean they're not um i don't think any of them are like full anarcho syndicalist communities not yeah, exactly. but the ones in Spain were at some point in the past and were working, except for the fact that yeah. more um, w w militaristic and authoritarian regimes existed nearby and, and took the opportunity of them not being a particularly militaristic type society to yeah. attack them and conquer them. Um, I think that will probably still be the case if somebody started, if somebody's country converted to anarcho, uh, anarcho syndicalism and lost their militarism. They probably would be an easy yeah. target for a militaristic regime in another country. Um, so that is still a problem. But the other thing I was going to say is that slow change is good. I don't believe in, in revolution. I think revolution is, is easy come, easy go. And I think real, lasting, positive political change happens slowly. And if you look at the, social, uh, the, the Soviet Union, that's what happened there. Is that it was too fast, and it was able to be co-opted by a, a splinter group within the movement that was not, did not have the real ideals of the overall movement at heart really you know so that's what happens is it, it's too easy to co-opt it it's too easy to take it over derail it if it happens too fast so yeah. i'm a very much an advocate of slow um, incremental change 
Um, and I don't think that's the case. I don't, I don't consider that with the case of someone like Bernie, because I don't think the term revolution is totally appropriate there. I think what he wanted was a, but what he wanted was significant change, but I wouldn't call what FDR did a revolution, you know, and they're pretty similar, you know, nobody calls FDR's new deal a revolution, you know? Mm. So yeah, I mean, that's what I think of Bernie. Is yeah. uh, that's basically where he was going to be. He was going to be the next FDR, introduce a, 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 a swathe, a policy platform of, of uh, pro-worker, anti-corporate um, legislation. You know, to, to bolster the middle class, and that is yeah. not a revolutionary idea, particularly not in America. It shouldn't be. You know, America is the country that created that. Yeah, kind it is. Of like how a lot of things here are seen as fairly radical. Like you know, we have a problem with abstinence only, sex education, for example, where like. Yeah. And like, you know, I'm actually in a class on human sexuality, a social justice course. Oh, no. But um, <laughs> we talk about how abstinence until marriage programs, they haven't decreased the levels of sexual activity where they've been implemented. They also are not like there's no reason, but they keep getting pushed. Um, and that's, yeah. you know, kind of the problem in the political sphere also is just like, you know, we keep trying keep trying to trickle down even though everybody worth their salt has said that it's not going to work and yeah yeah we just keep hoping uh, and that frustrates me as like a, that frustrates me as a young 19 year olds yeah ba basically my only advice to you Tom would be move America is fucked, yeah. man. It really is. I, mean, I wouldn't live in America. For one thing, I wouldn't pay, I wouldn't pay American taxes because it goes towards the military too much. And they yeah, kill yeah. people. So, and a lot of innocent people. So, fuck that. I would never pay tax as an American. I think that's immoral. Um, and so, yeah, I would no. never be able to live there because I also think being a tax avoider is immoral. So, <laughs> I just can't <laughs> live in America, basically. Um, well, in the state of Colorado, they implemented like um, accurate, I think, teen sex education and condoms and, you know, basically tried to um, do all the things to prevent teen pregnancy. And you know what happened? Teen pregnancy rates plummeted and so did abortion rates. Yep. That's how it works. So what we need are the Bernie people to focus their emphasis on the state legislatures, especially because yeah. of the 2020 census is going to be another opportunity to redraw the congressional lines. And we need to stop the gerrymandering that is giving wow. Republicans disproportionate power relative to their, you know, rate in the population. Yeah, we have a big problem with that in my country, too, of the politicians redefining the redistricting and stuff to to keep their seats. I think that's a problem in a lot of the West, whereas um, I think a lot of America's problems aren't problems that the rest of the advanced world has, um, you know, like the abstinence only thing. Like, that's not a thing here. That, that would be fucking weird if someone tried to do that here. Maybe in like a Catholic school somewhere, maybe, but. Um, yeah. But that would be a high school. We don't have um, Catholic. Oh, no, there are Catholic primary schools. Sorry, they're just not as common. Uh, yeah, Christian, I mean. Um, yeah, yeah there, there's problems yeah. that uh, that you guys have that we don't. Um, and then there's uh, the, like the whole political spectrum in America is different. Yeah. For example, uh, Hillary Clinton would not be a, she would not be able to run on a the left wing party here. She would be a right winger here. She's too hawkish, um, too connected to moneyed interests. She would never be a viable candidate for our, our left-wing party, the Labour Party. She just wouldn't, um, you know, and she, she has a, pa a past, like her being on the board of Walmart, for example, the board of directors of Walmart, that alone, it would be like, whoa, that's weird. You know, that's the sort of thing we associate with the right. Yeah. Well, you know, I always thought, well, first I always thought it would be a black man who would be president before a woman would be president. Oh, and yeah. um, I also thought it would be a Republican. For the precisely the reasons you said, uh, yeah. and um, you know Mag Margaret Thatcher, you can kind of go around you know, as you said, we have to be hawkish and we're always because we're women. Um, and, you know, you yeah. talked about you know don't hate. Well, maybe you know don't hate the player, hate the game. She kind of had to be that candidate in order to have a viable chance. Um, and also, you know, because of sexual stereotypes and dovishness, uh, I think have a burden that men don't to yeah. look more hawkish. Um, these in order to compensate for the gender biases yeah 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 we um, are actually kind of an unusual case in new zealand because our first female head of the state she was a third way not a progressive but she was not a hawk um she's very anti-military intervention and um, she's not well connected with moneyed interests or anything she's part of the political elite of course but um she wasn't yeah she's not the typical 
Margaret Thatcher style first female head of state. And I think that's because New Zealand is a more liberal country than most of the advanced world. We're kind of like a, you know, if you look at our past, we've got the first country in the world to give women the right to vote. We're the first um, country in the world to put in place an actual realistic working pragmatic decrim model for sex work. You know, there's a history of a lot of that kind of stuff here. Um, and for that reason, I think we're a more left leaning country than most. So we're able to elect a non hawkish woman. Mm. Yeah. But you're yeah. kind of, um, you're kind of dealing with a right wing administration now, aren't you? Yes. But having said that they are, they're just as right wing as anyone, you know, uh, like uh, David Cameron is for example, but they can't get away with the same level of shit. They can't go around like trying to, um, deregulate or um, privatize the NHS like the Tories are doing in the UK. They can't get away with stuff like that. They would love to. They'd love to deregulate as much as the Tories do, but they just can't. So they um, are right-wingers, definitely, but they can't really do the same level of damage. Most of the annoying shit about them is just stuff they say in public, which is cringeworthy as fuck, and just like ugh, embarrassing, you know, on a national level. Like our fucking prime minister with his... he's. He is, his attitudes towards women are so skewed that I would actually call him a misogynist. Um, I don't, I don't. John Oliver told me all about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like he had the incident where he pulled that woman's ponytail and stuff. He, he just acts like a kid when it comes to women, you know, he's got a really sort of infantile attitude towards women. Like they're the other kind of thing. Um, yeah. And, uh, so that's some fucking embarrassing and, you know, his history as a banker laid off thousands and thousands of workers and as a cutthroat corporatist and stuff is horrible, but yeah, on a practical day-to-day -day, real world ground level, they're not actually as dangerous as a lot of right wingers are, but they do mean that there's no left wing regime in charge when they're in charge, you know, which is annoying. To bring it back to uh, sort of um, world's views, um, Trump recently made a policy announcement, you know, spontaneously, I think, that would give women in the U.S. like six weeks of maternity leave. I wasn't yeah, sure if I was heard paid about that. that. Yeah. And, you know, it just demonstrates, again, the sort of patriarchal outlook that, that doesn't provide the same benefit to fathers or for any mm -hmm. other family need besides you know, having a child. And it's should be talking about when criticizing Trump, you know, the anti fans is to say that we need to question the gender norms around parenting and make it ex as expected that a man who you're going to hire is going to take paid uh, family leave as much as a, a female person that's interviewing for the same job. I, um, I so, two, yeah. two things to say about that. Now, I'm not an expert in this stuff myself, but I was raised by an expert in this stuff. My mom is that's her whole life, basically, uh, is she is a human resources, one of the top human resources consultants in my country, certainly one of the most well paid. Um, but she, she came up through EEO, she came up through this is the philosophy of business and management theory stuff about being e uh, equal opportunity employers. And that is how she's basically, um, there's other stuff to her career, obviously, than just that. But that has been a big, big part. So she's, she is an expert on it, and I've gleaned some stuff from her. She would say two things about that. She would say definitely PPL, uh, paid parental leave, is better than maternity leave, just objectively better. But um, having a maternity leave in, in, instead of having PPL isn't all bad. Because if you look at what's called retention, I don't know if you know what that means, but basically retention is uh, when a worker wants to go on holiday, are you, is the employer likely to replace them or retain them um, by taking a hit, like by uh, hiring a temp or whatever, uh, at cost to them in various ways, rather than doing the easy thing, which is to make their role redundant or, or to replace them instead of letting them go on, on unpaid leave or whatever. Um, men, uh, retention is, is sexist in, in, most in most countries' corporate structures. Males are favored for that. Um, they're more likely to, for example, the, the example my mom gives is a woman wanting to take time off to give birth to a baby and have the first couple of months, you know, living with the baby is more likely to be retained than a man going on holiday to Europe for three months or whatever, you know. It's just like statistically more likely. So that is an imbalance. Um, so men are more likely to be retained anyway. Um, having said that though, of course, PPL is best. Yeah. And we, uh, by the way, were the, f I think the first country to introduce that PPL. Hmm. 
that I know of anyway. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that's kind of what I mean by the, the problems in America or problems that the rest of the world doesn't have because like the st stuff you guys are fighting for a lot of the time is stuff we've had for a while. PPL is one of them. Um, annual leaves, paid sick leave. Um, that stuff, um, ho what's called holiday pay, where you get paid 6% of, of your total earnings when you quit a job, all that kind of stuff. There's stuff that um, the workers' rights groups in America are fighting for. And, you know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's horrible from my point of view because this is stuff that is just a, it's taken for granted, you know, in a country like mine. It's just a, na just a sort of fact of life that people just sort of get, have gotten used to. And it's to think that the biggest industrialized nation in the world advanced nation in the world doesn't have that is sad you know yeah i think it's an evidence of the capitalist system and insofar as you see the see the destruction of unions they went after the private sector first now they're going after the public sector yeah. and it's unions that would bargain these kinds of things so you have instead right to work states where you it's the right to be fired basically and they're doing everything they can to undermine the ways that the working class can collectivize in order to balance out that wage, that capitalist disparity of exchanging your labor for money. Um, See, yeah. I don't necessarily think, I mean, obviously it is a side effect of capitalism, absolutely. But I think it's, there's more to it than that because New Zealand is a very capitalistic society. But I think really what it comes down to is what I call employer focus and employee focus. America is a very fundamentally employer-focused country. The employers have all the rights. That's why you have at-will contracts that can be terminated for no reason. You know, employees can do, well, not in every state, but in a lot of states, you know, you can just get fired for no reason, you know. Um, and yeah, you can have, there's lawsuits, apparatuses that you can use to try and fight that and stuff, but whatever. In New Zealand, that does not happen, ever. You can't do that. In New, Ze New Zealand is a very employee-focused country, maybe the most in the advanced world that I know of. It's extremely difficult to terminate an employee in this country, in many people's opinions, much too difficult. You know, you've got to give the verbal warning, which is actually also a written warning, so it has to be written down. Then there's a written warning, and then there's this whole process that you've got to go through, um, which can be really um, annoying to people who want to terminate horrible staff members. It's, it's just, you know, a whole process. But that process is set up to protect employee rights, worker rights, you know. So it's, a, it's important, in my opinion. But that, I think that is really what it comes down to, because America is just so overwhelmingly employer-focused. It's ridiculous. Well, I think it comes back to that free market faith again, and also the the way that men who made it, the rags to riches types, were made into idols, which kind mm -hmm. of paved the way for Trump. And this idea that when he says, you know, when he's asked, "Have you made sacrifices?" he talks about his great buildings and his accomplishments. Yeah, and how he's hired because he's never actually, yeah, because he's never actually had to make a sacrifice. But he, that yeah. doesn't matter when he casts himself as a success. Yeah, uh, as a businessman. Yeah, and it's actually amazing because even most billionaires, I think, would probably, when asked, what have you sacrificed, would be able to name something, you know, but he can't. Yeah. He literally could not name a single thing, not a real, actual sacrifice. Yeah. He just went on his rap sheet again of just, like, all the things he's done over yeah, the course yeah, yeah. of And literally, he just went into his talking point. He started going on about how um, he's been so successful. He literally answered a question of what have you sacrificed. Yeah. Partly by saying, I've had tremendous success. Quote, that's a quote. He said, I've had yeah, tremendous yeah. success. That's not an answer to the question, what have you sacrificed? That's the opposite of an answer to what have you sacrificed. Uh -huh. But he just slips naturally into his talking points, you know. Mm. It's amazing yeah, that people think of him so as not a politician. He is such a politician. It's amazing. Yeah, he's gaming, he's gaming the entire election system and it's got the whole propaganda PR system. It's amazing, but it's terrible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. He's very good at, at manipulating the, the nature of what the media has become in America. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, most, of them, uh, most of them lack self-awareness. Well, not self-awareness, but awareness of it to such a ridiculous degree in the media. Like, I remember, who was it? There was one person who interviewed him who actually brought it up. The one that I know of. And that was, um, oh God, what's her name? The blonde lady on Fox News who he said was bleeding from her wherever. No, Megan Kelly. Oh, uh, yeah. Megan oh, Kelly yeah. brought that up in an interview. She said, um, "Do you have you noticed how? Um, oh, you've said that you got two billion dollars worth of free media from the um, from the uh, cable news channels. Do you think that's in part because of the controversies you've generated? And did you do that on purpose?" And he's like, "Yeah, kind of. Yeah." 
he was a little bit honest about it. You know, if he was very honest, he would have been, yeah, totally. Of course. That was my whole thing. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. But that was, that was the only time I remember anyone actually bringing that up. And that is amazing. What surprises me is when people see this stuff going on, they're paying attention now to more of the hate crimes and the KKK associations with Trump and what people are saying too on social media and the way people are harassed and they'll say, Oh, it didn't used to be like this. And like, well, no, it was always like this, but you just didn't see it because you were a victim of it. And And now it's in the media. And now we're just facing the reality. Yeah. Body cams, man, on cops has changed everything. Just people having cell phone cameras and pointing them at police, police being mandated to use body cams that are recording. That is the change. The police brutality isn't new. Not at all. Right. In fact, it's probably yeah. not as bad as it used to be now, you know, if anything. Um, but now we just know about it, you know. Now, and, and the, the really painful part is, this is, black people in America have been saying this stuff for decades, but just nobody, nobody listened, you know. Nobody took it seriously. It wasn't until we literally had video of it that people actually started taking it seriously. It just goes to show how um, untrusted, unlistened to minority groups in America are. But we had a black president, so everything's okay now. Everything's fine. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And racism <laughs> doesn't exist anymore. That's oh, how it yeah. works. Yeah. It no. didn't exist before, but it definitely doesn't exist now. Yeah, absolutely. Post-racial. Yeah. yeah. And it's not like Obama's like um, na- you know, nationality was, was questioned or anything like that. It's not like anybody was racist about it. Oh, no. <laughs> but we're post-racial. Oh so. man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you're entirely right. It's only because it's you know sensational news now when it get, does get recorded. You know, if it's a, I just can't get out of my mind the image of a man who was running away from a white police officer and he shot him in the back. A uh, know, black yeah. man running away and shot him in the back, and you can't unsee that. You know, once yeah. it's it's out there and. You know, it, it does, it, it's going to take more white communities participating in these questioning and, de- you know, questioning incidents and um, demanding body cams and demanding independent reviews of police shootings, because we want to make sure that it's, you know, a fair hearing. Mm. All these things are entirely reasonable. Um, they don't affect anybody's civil rights, but they protect, protect everybody's. Yeah, yeah. And uh, pe- people have this weird idea that um, it's a threat to the police being able to carry out their job. But like a lot of things in America, that argument ignores the rest of the world and the realities in the rest of the world. Um, like, you know, with the, like the medical thing, like, oh, you know, it, um, universal health care could never work. It's like, well, it works everywhere else. Why wouldn't it work in America? It would, you know, there's no evidence to say it would be. I mean, people say, you know, America's different in X, Y, and Z way, but that is not compelling evidence in terms of it wouldn't work. In my opinion, it would work. It would work just fine. Um, and it's, you know, it's the same um, with the police reform because America's militarized police is not really the case most other, well, it's the case in places like South Africa, but it's not the case in like other advanced first world nations. Like uh, in Britain, for example, they don't carry guns, you know, Britain's got a decent amount of crime, but they just deal with it in other ways. And they don't get killed at a higher rate than American cops or anything. Having said that, I think there are too many firearms in America for America to totally demilitarize and totally like get rid of the firearms that they carry on them and stuff. I think there's just too much violence in America at the current moment, but you know, that could be addressed and eventually could be fixed, you know? Um, so these aren't, these aren't um, problems that are insurmountable. Um, yeah, and I think uh, a lot of the arguments that I hear about, you know, between Americans about things are ignoring test cases in the rest of the world. There's also the problem of money, that weapons producers, gun manufacturers, um, when there is a mass shooting using an AR-15, see a skyrocket in sales of AR-15s. Yeah. So they have a, a, a massive population of, you know, over 330 million people, um, some of whom collect a lot of guns, and they're making money. And as long as they are going to have a place where they can sell these weapons and turn a profit, special interests in Congress are going to make it very difficult um, to change the laws to reduce the amount of guns produced every year. I mean, maybe we can have a moratorium on gun manufacturing for 10 years and then see what happens. Have buyback programs. Yeah, like the one in Australia that was really, really successful. Mm. Uh Yeah. Funny. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that I don't understand in American discourse is the left-wing people who are gun advocates. Um, I, I do, with one exception, I get oh, it with yeah. black people. 
black people who are gun rights advocates, I get that yeah. because they are targeted more. And um, uh, people often, the Second Amendment arguments often get thrown out the window when it comes to black people having guns. I don't remember people making that argument about the Black Panthers, for example. Um, you know, so there is a dis racial disparity there. So I get that. But I don't understand white liberals who are gun rights activists, uh, advocates. There's because, also, oh, go on, sorry. Yeah, a lot of ANCAPs actually are pretty big gun advocates. And even, even so, I, mean, I can't really say I love myself in with that. I mean, I think if you want a really good um, kind of pro-gun argument from Ladnos Productions actually did a video called um, Ken Leftist Be Pro-Gun, which was like, I don't agree with him, but I understand his reasonings, I guess. It's, it's mostly like they ever try to use it against you in the way that they do. Yeah, I had two issues with, with the leftist pro-gun argument. For one thing, it's unrealistic because the original v reason behind the Second Amendment is no longer relevant. Um, people, yeah. um, private militias cannot compete with the U.S. military anymore, and they haven't been able to for, I don't know, 60 years, maybe a lot more. Um, so that that is no longer relevant. Um, and the other thing is, I was thinking the other day about um, going, like the idea of going to a gun range and firing at a target. To me, uh, this is just my opinion, my perspective, but to me, I wouldn't be able to get images of like Adam Lanza stalking the halls of Sandy Hook Elementary School out of my head when doing that, because it's a fetishization of that sort of thing to me. I can't separate those two things in my head. I just can't. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's because yeah. I'm not an American. I don't know. But to me, that could be it. firing at a target is, is, would give me images of a guy like Adam Lanza walking down the school well, with the same posture whatever you know targeting fucking children and shooting them dead and stuff so i i think it's horrible and i couldn't do it yeah i think if i could sorry yeah i'm just going to jump in um yeah and then and tom can, can go but i uh, just because i was <laughs> i've been waiting to say this for a while <laughs> uh, i think it is important uh it's hard to explain the culture of guns w when you've not grown up in america because there is a mythology of america that includes guns and it's yeah. something that's also reinforced by Hollywood. But, yeah. you know, from the earliest pilgrims, you know, you hear stories of people keeping the rifles over their doors because, you know, the Indian Native American tribe could be, you know, coming by or whatever. And I'm thinking about stories of uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder that I read growing up, you know, in the late 1970s and early 80s. So these stories and notions are from the start of the country's history. Yeah. And then you've got um, the, the wild, wild west, of course, where, you know, people were required to turn in their guns when they entered the city limits because you didn't want drunk people who had guns <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. <laughs> in, in these, uh, these cities. So there were some more strict gun regulations. Um, and then we get to the 20s where you start to get machine guns and machine guns were banned. And it was actually the, um, you know, I think the NRA didn't even oppose it because it was such a violent weapon. Mm. So there's the, the history of, of the guns in America is a history of America yeah. going right through yeah. to modern times. And the other thing too, is when we talk about guns, it's a very uh, all encompassing topic. Now my, my dad, for instance, is a hunter and he has a gun safe that has a dozen guns. Some he's won in like raffles and stuff and he just keeps them because it might sell them someday, but otherwise he's just got them, you know, collecting dust. He's got a rabbit gun. He's got a deer gun. He's got, you know, a duck gun. So he's, he's a rifle, I should say. So these are all hunting rifles. That's, a, I think, a different category as someone who grew up um, so close to nature where my family still go deer hunting. You know, they still engage in all of these practices of going out and you know, making venison sausage and then eating at Thanksgiving. This stuff still happens, you know, yeah. just like in the olden days. And, um, uh, but then you get AR-15s. And so the question becomes, what becomes the gun you can have versus what you can't. And also now there's um, the constitutional, um, sorry, the Supreme Court precedent uh, with Scalia writing, I think, for the majority that people have a right to basically access a handgun in self-defense. They extended the Second Amendment to include personal safety, even though it's about militias and keeping down slave revolts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, mm. Yeah, in the South, that was their, that was their whole thing. Yep. about re well-regulated militia were anti-slave bands of trying to hunt down the uh the little you know um conclaves of of escaped slaves and stuff yeah 